Welcome. Omnia is a medical doctor and was the first official youth envoy um, for the president of the 27 UN Climate Change Conference and the Egyptian Minister of Foreign Affairs. You're passionate about developing strategies and solutions at the intersection of planetary health, climate justice and intergenerational equity to unlock the systemic change for the health and the prosperity of people and the planet. And in our briefing, you've emphasized that climate change besides many other things, is a global health issue. And I'd love to come back to that in just a moment and hear more about it. Pim Sullivan-Taylor, also to my right, is currently studying environmental sciences and geography at King's College in London and works towards turning schools into places to cultivate hope and foster tangible action in the face of the climate crisis. And young people will be the ones, as we know, that are most affected by the climate crisis in the future, yet they're still not really listened to, and you are about to change that. Nathan, to my very right over here, is a youth climate justice activist and was, until recently, the youth advisor to the UN Secretary General. His work, and may I say tireless activism, happens at the intersection of youth movements, climate change, inequality, and injustice. So a lot of things to unpack here, and um, very exciting path that took you here onto this stage. The planet crisis affects all of us, and the most vulnerable communities the most, and certainly those that have done the least to cause it are the ones to suffer, which is just a screaming injustice um, that we hope to unpack a little. Nathan, you have told me and you keep saying that climate change is essentially a justice issue, um, among other things. Can you elaborate a little on that and give us uh, an insight into your thinking and into your work? Well, that's a, that's a big task to fulfill after Vanessa talking, and some of you have already heard me talk today. Um, I think that I'll, I'll share a little bit about where I come from and my positionality in the climate justice debate. I, uh, I grew up as a queer child in the Alps. I'm actually French, even though I reside in Canada. And um, as I was, you know, grappling with my identity and working on these issues and um, also witnessing, you know, the polarization um, today, uh, of course, especially on the other side of the Atlantic, but it's coming, surely, uh, in Europe as well. Um, the marginalization and discrimination that queer people are being victim of. And I had that on one hand, and on the other hand, I had, you know, witnessing the, the, the climate impacts in the Alps. Many of you probably have family there or are going there. Um, I mean, we don't even have glacier there. It's crazy. In 15 years, I've seen the Mont Blanc completely disappearing. And thinking about those two issues, those two crises, uh, one very personal and one very global, I realized that the root causes were actually very much the same. Patriarchy, colonization, uh, white supremacy, um, heteronormativity. Sorry, these are big concepts, but both those um, crises actually have somehow the same roots. And I think that, if anything, climate justice is an invitation to invite the equity, to invite the fairness into our very climate uh, sustainability conversations. No, uh, doing renewable energy is not always good. If you steal indigenous land, if you use renewable energy and um, carbon credits to buy loans that don't belong to you, that reproduces inequality. Um, if you use massive materials to build the new uh, uh, billions of EVs that um, uh, car companies are selling us, this is not uh, going to bring us more climate equity. And again, and again, and again. And I think that um, it is really important, like Adenike said earlier today, um, that everyone really thinks about climate change, about the planetary crisis, the multiple crises that we're facing from an equity and fairness perspective, because obviously it can be another opportunity for another form of sustainability. And actually, do you know who are the biggest investors in renewable energy right now? It's the fossil fuel industry. And I'll leave you to think about that. So Nathan, um, to just quickly touch upon that again, 
you were saying that the climate crisis isn't just accelerating injustice and it's unjust in the sense of who's being affected. You are also saying that by creating more justice and equality, we have a powerful remedy and an ingredient to overcome it and to work towards it. Um, so for you, it's sort of, as I understand, two sides of the same coin in a way. Yeah, 100%. And I think what's really important is to realize that not every green or climate solution is good for the people and it can do a lot of damage. And this is why it's really important to have those conversations here where it's all about changing and sustainability and greening the business. Are we greening the business and also enhancing equity and, and redistributing wealth? Or are we just basically recreating another inequality? And this is a call to action, right? A call to action to say, you're doing great, and you need to do even better in terms of thinking about the people, about diversity, and about redistribution. Does yeah. that make sense? No, it makes total sense. And thank you in advance um, to bring that really holistic perspective to this wider conversation. One thing won't do it all. It's many pieces to uh, a bigger puzzle. Um, Pim, at a very young age, you've started to organize youth climate conferences in dozens of schools in your community, and you're really working with people in schools that are sort of affected by it the most in the future. And from the eyes of the youth, very practical, can you help us understand a little what are sort of the, the most talked about issues? What are the conversations that are happening in these spaces? W what are they most angry about, most hopeful for? G give us a, a bit of an insight into these uh, spaces and conversations, if you may. So, so I'll start with, um, as well as what Nathan talked about was my positionality, which I think is something that we all need to kind of first start off with when we're having these conversations. So I grew up in uh, Southeast Asia and spent the majority of my childhood there. So I experienced the education system there and the way that uh, people approach the environment there. And then I moved here and I saw the way the education system was here and how people felt about the environment here. And, um, but the majority of my perspective at the moment is from talking to students in the global north. So from the students I've spoken to, I would say that um, majority of their worries is it's a kind of double-edged sword of what contribution can they make, but at the same time seeing that the governments are not living up to the standards that the youth put like expectations for. Um, and despite youth participation, I think a lot of youth who are involved in the climate space are very aware of youth washing. So I think it's a double-edged sword of where they want to be co a contributive factor, but it's difficult to tell when is it green uh, youth washing and when is it when you're actually making a contribution. Um, and the majority of times in schools anyway with just students who maybe aren't in the climate space but want to be. There was a study recently at Force of Nature that showed that 85% of young people actually wanted to be in a job to do with climate change or the environment. But only 35, oh, 39% felt like they had the qualifications for it or the skills for it, which um, I think it, it, there's several factors depending on what country you're coming from and the support you had depending on what type of school you're in. But I think the majority of the way that youth have that double-edged sword of wanting to contribute, and then you have the youth washing, and then feeling like whether what they contribute is enough when they're not seeing that the governments are living up to the standards that they wish a government would yeah. live up to. I can imagine that to be very frustrating, and we see it uh, at the rightful and legitimate protests um, all around the world. So thank you for bringing that perspective of the very young. Omnia, COP28, um, 
will, for the first time, dedicate, as I understand, a whole day or at least a, a, a big chunk of the agenda to the topic of health. I'd love to bring that perspective in. Um, share with us why that connection um, between the planetary crisis and health is so crucial. Let's start on a very basic level and then dig a little deeper. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, first of all, um, yeah, when it comes to how we see climate change and now there is the powerful narrative and understanding of how the climate crisis is a health crisis because it directly affects our health especially the ones that are most impacted with the least access to the resources, to the healthcare services that they need. If I use a very clear example, when we see a climate-related disaster and we see the number of deaths, the number of people who have direct injuries, the emergency rooms being flooded with patients who are able to access the services that they need, but also what's even more impactful is how the mental health of people is affected. And a study shows that it is 40 to 1 when it comes to an extreme weather event. But what is even more common and what I personally see, saw as a medical doctor in the ER during the summer is the high rates of patients coming in with heat stroke. And if they are above 65 and they're not managed in time, they would die. But and that's also, not going to get better. But also what we see, especially during the summers and high rates of crop failures and many farmers right now are committing suicide because they cannot provide food for their family. Their crops are not growing anymore. They are living in extended periods of drought. And this also affects both their physical, mental health as well as the health of their families. But I'm, I'm not here to just say that the climate crisis as a health emergency and the doom and gloom is just now there is loss of the humanization of what climate change is and when we saw for example with the COVID-19 pandemic we saw that it was a health emergency countries responded the funds were flowing in directly but we do not see the same urgency with climate change because as simple as it affects the most vulnerable communities and they are the ones that are least represented in the climate spaces and both their health and their mental well-being is being affected on a daily basis and it also exacerbates their basic access to food water education healthcare services and when we look at the injustice at an intergenerational level the ones that are being affected most are the children and the young people right now one out of five children lack access to the basic safe drinking water that they need and when we look at air pollution, which is caused by the industries that we're surrounded with, nine out of 10 children breathe in polluted air. Seven million people die every year directly because of air pollution. And only five years ago in the UK, the first seven-year-old girl had on her death certificate air pollution as the main cause. So it is a health crisis that we need to acknowledge. But on the other hand, action for climate change is also action for our health. When we look at changing our air, when we look at improving our access to green spaces, to biodiversity, when we promote actions like active transport, when we also look at our food systems and providing sustainable, nutrici nutritious dietary change, and, and all of that really improves our health as well as the health of the environment, because as, as obvious as it is, our health is dependent on the health of the planet. And we have a responsibility to protect the health of our people and the health of our environment. Thank you very much, Omnia. Very clear. So I think we're kind of getting to the core of um, this broader topic, which I know the session is about loss and damage, but I think one layer below is the climate justice and justice issues, and you tackle different um, aspects of it. I do want to honor, though, that this conversation also wants to bring in that element, and I'd love to start with you and ask you um, what your thoughts are on the loss and damage um, agreement at COP27, and maybe also what some activists in your network, your, the people that you surround yourself with, what are they saying, what's the talk, what needs to happen? G give us an idea of, um, of the conversation at the moment, because it is one piece of the puzzle, but as we heard from Vanessa, a lot more needs to happen there. So some thoughts from you would be appreciated. Yeah. Um, the, the establishment of the loss and damage fund is, for me, I always see it as a story of how 
years of activism can then lead to true impact and true mobilization and really putting in the pressure on countries to act. Loss and damage activists has been there for tens of years, but it was never even an agenda point at the highest level of decision making for climate change. It was only in Egypt that it was put as an agenda point for the first time. And then countries were put under the pressure, especially by civil society, by young climate activists, to establish this fund. But as Vanessa said, it's not just about the loss and damage fund, it's not just about the adaptation fund and other um, finance facilities, it's also about addressing the root causes and addressing mitigation and reducing the carbon emissions, which leads to all of that. But establishing a loss and damage fund is also a powerful message of solidarity. We're now countries that have been emitting the most are going to pay reparations for the communities and the people who were impacted the most and contributed the least. To now we're seeing the countries that are in the small state islands that are being destroyed in every aspect in terms of their education facilities, their healthcare facilities, their homes, and even loss of their loved ones. And they have contributed to the very minimum of what we see now with the carbon emissions. And now is the time to pay reparations for that. And we are not just happy that we have a loss and damage fund. It's also about, is this fund going to be accessible? Is this fund going to reach the ones that have been impacted the most? Is it going to, going to be sustainable? We do not just want to have a fund that will take years and years for communities that are affected, that are doing the real grassroots action and still cannot access a very difficult process. We want it to be accessible. We also want it to be made in a way that is co-designed with the ones who have the who have been affected the most and this is when we would say that we have successfully established an inclusive and an effective loss and damage fund what are what are others including yourself saying are we seeing that is that happening is there a reason for hope in making the loss and damage agreement inclusive diverse uh, driven by the idea of justice and accessibility. What, what, are, what are you hearing? And I know not everyone's an expert on loss and damage, but you might have some thoughts to provide here as well. I think something that a lot of people are beginning to understand is that we can't use the same system that caused the climate crisis to solve it, which is why I think loss and damage, if it is put in the form of grants, is such an opportunity for transformation and um, transformation of the communities that need it most to be regenerative and, and to move away from those systems that created the climate crisis in the first place. So I think that's something that's really hopeful about loss and damage and um, that I hopefully think we can look forward to. Thank you, Pim. Um, well, I'm not the best at that, but I think it's important to do a bit of like what we call in the non-profit world. I don't know if you do that in your businesses, but it's a theory of change. Um, I think that first, looking at what has happened in 2015, all the states, and I, I said it before, like most of the planet are authoritarian governments. So let's always remember. And when you also look at the states of our democracies, you can also wonder if, you know. Um, so that's the state of the world. They all committed, the Global North, at least, you know, like the wealthiest co countries, to give $100 billion to the Global South to get ready for getting their, you know, green transition, uh, mitigation strategies, adaptation strategies, and they never delivered. And I think that one of the most frustrating things for me when I was a youth advisor is to discuss with, of course, my country representatives, most of yours as well, the French representatives, bunch of white people who work in uh, big fancy offices. Um, they're very well paid. Sorry, that's maybe a bit too much. Um, all of these people, um, plus, you know, the United States and a bunch of other countries committed to that. And all of them say, no, we're actually almost there. Right now, we're giving about 80 or 90 million, uh, mil sorry, billion dollars every year to the Global South. But this is a lie. Why? Because the way they calculate that is that they look at all the finance that they're giving in terms of private finance, in terms of 
any, for example, in France, we have the Agence Française de Développement. When the Agence Française de Développement gives funding for a project that includes somehow a little bit of biodiversity of climate, it is the whole investment that is calculated as a climate grant or a climate loan to the country in the Global South. So all this money that the Global North countries have been saying they're giving is actually, has actually never reached the Global South because it was never given in true way. And of course, what Vanessa was reminding us today, it's very, very rarely in grants. Actually, almost just 10% goes in grants, um, which means, you know, money that is restricted, but at least it's given to do the actual work, not just through private finance and so on. And that is so upsetting. I think no one can understand why the UNFCCC process, uh, the UNFCCC is, you know, the, the UN process for the climate negotiation is such a toxic space without understanding that because global South countries, uh, G70 countries have been lied for decades. And so until that hasn't been solved, I see no possibility that any other funds will work. I, I just wanted to add on top of that is exactly what you're saying is the the people who are currently meant to be funding them I feel like they're seeing the climate crisis as something of the future something that is the, this blurred image of what might happen but is that re are they really ever going to be affected and I think we need to also like we all know that it's in the present and that's what the global south are experiencing and maybe you know that's th they're just not realizing that that what what we had a session earlier today um and someone showed a picture of the polluted seas that they had lived by and they raised the question of what would you do if you lived there and i don't think that is asked enough of what would you actually do if you were in that situation um so yeah just like Vanessa said earlier, the people are affected right now. It is happening right now. And I actually really appreciate, Nathan, how you cut through the fog and bring it down to the essentials. So please don't shy away from making bold statements here. That's what this place is here for. And I would actually like to build on that and say maybe a quick round of statements from all of you or whoever um, has something to share here. Besides the loss and damage agreement, what do you think are sort of the, the sledgehammer things that we need to do right now, that need to happen. You've talked in the governance um, session earlier today, for example, about the billionaires, the fossil fuel companies, um, there were issues of taxes coming up. What are sort of things that you would say have to happen right now that you would want to lobby for and that we can maybe join in and, and, and push for together? Yeah, please. Yeah, I think there's so many things, but uh, <laughs> one thing one thing I personally would like to see how, you know, not just seeing climate change as a as a health issue, which is something that anyone would relate to, because it's either your health, the health of your children, your grandchildren, the ones that you love, and this is when you start to think about I need to act, but I would also see it as a, as a rights issue. So your your basic right to a safe environment, your right to actually get access to the opportunities that you need and that you deserve, the right to be living in a safe place where you're not worrying about the next climate disaster or worrying about the fact that the place that you're in right now might not exist in the next 10 or 15 or 20 years. And this is not too far away. So just the, having the governments rec recognize that and also having that sense of credible, meaningful relationship and integration of perspectives of the ones that see that, which is young people, and not just young people, but actually young experts in whatever field that we're in, and having that integration and having our voice really brings in that urgency that is needed, but also brings in that level of dedication and, and drive to actually center our right and the right of our generation to have the environment that they deserve. I think this is something that I would like to see governments and yeah. also private sector and everyone do. Expand the conversation and make sure that it's understood as a human rights issue. Um, Pim, Nathan, anything to, to add? 
Um, well, I'll answer based on what I know, which is education and mental health. So, obviously, I think education at, is just the basis of how we should all, just, it's the beginning of how we all start off anywhere. Um, and I think that educating people to also be critically, to critically analyze what's in front of them, um, especially students as well, I think is really important in, in looking at the climate crisis and how we should tackle it. Um, and also, yeah, mental health uh, based on what we do at Force of Nature and also just the difference between how I think I was having a conversation one time where in the global north we've experienced a lot of eco-anxiety, but in the global south they actually experience more eco-grief because they're seeing that loss of their um, environments and how can we support them in that and also co-produce in ways to support them between whether it's co-production within their own countries or within where we are or different countries together. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, some of the friends know already, but um, one of the things that gave me the most hope when I was a youth advisor was to talk with so many different youth communities and um, learning about what they were doing all around the world. And, you know, we, we didn't just, like, let the largest environmental movement in history. We also are holding policymakers accountable every day. We're also pushing them to act more. And so I think... My hope is that we can do more of that. And so we just released a study that shows that only 0.76% um, of all climate philanthropy goes to youth climate justice networks um, that are doing amazing work. And uh, I'm part of a collective that's creating a new structure called the Youth Climate Justice Fund. And it's a youth-led, movement-led, participative, uh, ground-making initiative to uh, kind of superpower um, youth groups that are fighting for climate justice and as you could see in this panel it means various different things and that's the beauty of it because we need energy on all those issues and they're all interlinked um, so that's what gives me hope and I guess it's also a call to action to support it yeah wonderful. we'll be launched next month <laughs> yeah no thank you for sharing that after our briefing conversation um, a few days ago I got really excited about the fund that you're suggesting and uh, I wish it all the best. With that, maybe just a quick last round. Uh, things that you work on right now that you want people to join in, what's top of your mind, your heart, um, a bit like what Nathan did, maybe Pim and um, Omnia, you could yeah. wrap us up with that. I mean, we are both wor working together on, um, so it is a project called Connecting Climate Minds mm -hmm. and it's looking at climate change and mental health to understand and uh, both creating a research and, a, and an action agenda. So really understanding at the regional level, what are the mental health impacts of climate change? And at the same time, how can we develop solutions that are based on these needs? And we're not just creating a series of dialogues, it's actually a community. And we're doing it in seven SDG regions. So we have regional communities of practice that are being set up. And the most important thing about the project that it is centered on the needs of people who lived experience they are co-leading the initiative entirely with us and it's based on their needs as well as young people who are ambassadors and they are not advisors but they are partners in this global and regional mobilization to really set the new you know narrative but also understanding and responding to the mental health impacts uh, of climate change wonderful um, wishing you all the best with that. Pim, um, some last words. Um, well, I'm not really connected to any work at the moment, but I think I would just like to leave it on saying that um, I spoke to some kids a couple of weeks ago who really inspired me, and they had this idea about this business plan and things like that. And I would just like to leave you on to think about when you see something that's good, think about how you can make it better and always question it and always think, it might seem good already, but what can I do to make it even better? And how can I make it regenerative? And how can I make it circular? And yeah, I think question, 
question everything and continue to all, all of improve. us raising our ambitions uh, yeah, for what's I think possible so. and and try doing it joyfully and and even though this was quite a heavy panel i think we also I sense need a to lot remember. of joy from all three yeah. of you um, <laughs> um, so thank you for that yeah thank you very much okay Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure and honor to be having uh, you on stage and sharing um, and going through this conversation with you. Thank you, Omnia, Pim and Nathan um, for your contribution.